Geordie's box of toys and his, his palette and his colours and his imagination is so fantastic that you're not really in a movie. You're in George's head. Playing Max is very much just being able to sit with George and do whatever he wants. I met him once and I just knew that it was going to be something really special. And then, of course, he so didn't let me down. Where Charlize has the precision of the dancer, Tom has that sort of wildness. They're emotional warriors on our behalf. They are prepared to lay themselves with all their humanity in front of an audience. The best thing about Max is that he's not just a quintessential cookie-cutting hero. He's an anti-hero. A man who's got a tremendous amount of trauma and horror in his life, and all he wants to do is go home. That he doesn't have a home. He's searching for something. It was that thing that went the moment Tom walked through the door. Uh, I felt that same, whatever that feeling is, that I felt when Mel Gibson first walked in the door 30 odd years ago. There's no point in ever trying to pretend that I was going to replace Mel's Max. Mel Gibson is Mad Max. That's that. They used to say, no Mel, no Max. But there is that similarity between Tom and Mel. Very masculine. At the same time, there was a softness uh, uh, capable of gentleness as well. So it was a very interesting dynamic. I met Mel. We had lunch, and he handed over the torch. I don't think he felt very impressed <laughs> at the time, but I think that's Mel's one. But then he wrote some nice emails as well to my agent and said that it was the right thing to do and that he'd possibly met somebody that was crazier than him. Which can only be a, can be a compliment. George decided that he was a kind of wolf, Max. He's in a bad way. He's, he's captured and he's no different from a wild animal. Monosyllabic, can't talk, doesn't know his own voice. On escaping his situation and meeting Furiosa, he slowly finds his voice very slowly throughout the piece. When I met with George, I believed him when he said to me, I want to create a female character that can stand next to Max, this very iconic character who is like the ultimate when it comes to this road warrior. I thought that would be interesting to find someone who in another time would be regarded as a great beauty, but in this post-apocalyptic world, she's become a hard-bitten warrior. He was so excited about creating an anti-heroic woman who was really driven by these very, very pure human flaws. The paradox, here is a very strong woman, statuesque more than just physically in her persona, in her spirit. And at the same time, you recognize the vulnerability. It's not just a mask. The, the two things are there. This idea that she's kind of saving these women, to me, just didn't feel as interesting as they belong to a man who hurt her incredibly, and she's just had enough. And she's going to take these women with her. And she's going to take what matters to him the most. So it really is the ultimate story of revenge. Furiosa is by far as important as Max is in the film. In many ways, it's her film, and Max is, is on for the ride. They're both built to survive the most isolated, horrific elements. Of course, they meet, and of course, there's a relationship, an unspoken understanding, and there's a connection between those two. And it was essential that they met, and that they connect, and they help one another, and they move forward, and they are connected. It can't end well. <laughs> Nothing's good and everything hurts out there. And that's what Furiosa says to them. Everything is painful, you know? Because she knew the world that they were going into and there's no room for attachment. There's no room for attachment. Max and Furiosa, they don't trust each other at all. You know, and there's no reason to. In that way, you can trust each other not to trust each other. Hey, what's your name? What do I call you? Does it matter? These are two people who know only how to take care of themselves. The material allowed for us to kind of go up against each other and also 
create two characters that didn't, you know, fall for each other or became each other's best friend or this was so truthful to the world that he set them in that there was no room for anything like that to happen. Trust has to be earned in that, in that environment. And trust is earned by deed and not by talk. And also through necessity, because neither of them wanted to be together, but it was necessity that they had to stay together in order to get away together, in order to part company. So they need never see each other ever, ever again because neither of them wanted them to be anywhere near each other. It set up the two characters to be that, and there were days on the shoot where Tom and I felt that way towards each other, and I think it was impossible not to have that. I think even if you don't believe that material affects you, it's an impossible notion. When you're living something and doing something for eight months straight, it just is under your skin, and you want it to be under your skin as an actor. And so there were days where I think it was almost just easier for us to show up and deal with each other in that way. We were up against conditions that didn't necessarily make for an easy shoot. There's nothing but desert. No, nothing but desert. The experience of silence, you know, there are no birds chirping, there's nothing happening. It was painfully isolating at times, painfully isolating. Where we were was like being on the moon. We really were in the middle of nowhere. And then this compound of like very strange, half-naked people with, you know, harpoons and just weird. And then George would be standing in the middle of it all in this leather jacket that he never took off, and a thermal jacket, and, like, and a shirt, and his military trousers, and his shoes, his, you know, his glasses on his head. Never took this leather jacket off, and it was hundreds of degrees. It was hot. George had more leather on than Max did. You'd expect any normal person to pass out in that jacket. <laughs> I mean, I always wear leathers. We were hot, you know? <laughs> we were very hot. And George will ask you to do things which may seem insane, and they are, and then when you see the movie, having been there, and I see what he meant now, and he was trying to explain in the sand when we were out there, and it was a nightmare. <laughs> a brilliant nightmare and confusing. They all make sense, perfect sense. All that I needed to do was just be with George and do what George wanted me to do. Although we were in this vast wasteland of Namibia, for a lot of the time, our cast was stuck in the cabin of the war ring. I realized that that was all I was doing, pretty much every day showing up in this movie, was getting in this war rig and dramatizing from this space that was this big. And there was a great challenge in that. And also, most of the time, you know, really only having this part of your body that you could really explore storytelling with. So we were basically just sitting in a truck whilst people attack you. And somehow you've got to tell the story that this is a road to redemption. I think it could be very frustrating to a lot of people, but to George, it's, it's in the challenge of all of that, it's almost what he thrives in, and that's when he comes alive. You have a filmmaker that is seeing possibilities where you could never even see possibilities. Once you're in that vehicle with the Furiosa and Max and the girls, they're just going somewhere. There's not a lot of talking about stuff. It was almost a silent movie. Basically, uh, it, it, it all happens without words. They speak only when it's necessary. Furious is very pragmatic with the language. Now pick up what you can and run. Max is very laconic. You can get in. There is no luxury for words, but I think all of us struggled with it in the beginning. You doubt that you can get something across without the use of words. And it's good to sometimes be forced into a direction where you're out of your comfort zone. So you need to have people around you that can show you a weight and depth and a breadth of emotion and understanding and change with very little dialogue. And that's why casting was absolutely key, you know, and Charlize, she nails it, as, as she always does, you know? I think what George really, really succeeded at is creating a world that I think will be extremely satisfying to 
his loyal fans who love the movies from the 70s, but also to a generation who might not know those movies. Everybody wanted to do, achieve George's vision, really. What he, what he, and ultimately, you know, just wanted to make him happy. Because he had a plan. I think that the cast that were there bonded, as we all did, and they had uh, difficult moments, but just having, you know, gone into the wilderness for longer than the 40 days and 40 nights and, and survived. I don't think I've ever hugged cast and crew as much as I did on this film when we were done. It was a really emotional goodbye. We had really been through it. We had lived it. We were in it. You know, it's still a very, very close family. And I don't think a lot of movies have that because it's just not enough time where you really feel like you've seen people at their worst and you've seen them at their best. And, and at the end of the day, you just kind of go, we did it. <laughs>